uh, was a single unmarried dad in law school. Um, um, after I made documentary films for public broadcasting, so I double majored in psych and film. And I made one about a prison which resulted in being closed, which for some reason made me want to go to law school to do prisoners' rights rather than realizing the power of film. But, uh, and I supported myself as a carpenter while I was in law school, because if you pass the exams, they don't care whether you attend classes or not. And I've asked, I mentioned this yesterday, if I've asked 50 lawyers this question, if you could only do one of three things and none of the other two, which would you do to pass through law school if your life depended on it? Go to all the lectures, read all the cases, or be in a study group. Everyone I've asked that question to says be in a study group. More on that. So the study group, this, this notion of a, of a collection of small people like a seminar talking deeply about something is pivotal. I then, uh, to my mom's chagrin, got a job teaching carpentry uh, which I did for 11 years, working class kids in Boston at the height of the desegregation of the Boston public schools, and realized right away that these kids were quite as intelligent as the middle class kids I was just in law school with. So 33 years later, my career has been about uh, desegregating kids in schools, so that, because I think that we mispredict, in the United States at least, uh, but most other places, but we mispredict based on socioeconomic status, what kids can and can't do, and we mispredict based on ethnicity, we mispredict based on gender, we mispredict uh, based on uh, limiting on English proficiency in our case, and we also now are mispredicting based on standardized test scores in my uh, humble opinion. So, okay. so High Tech High was formed uh, as a single school, which I was the principal of, we call them directors. Uh, uh, it was a decade ago, we're now finishing our t uh, in, in our 10th year, and, uh, um, and we knew that we wanted to be uh, a place where we focused on production, not consumption. Uh, the name High Tech, not, High Tech High was not something that I gave it. It was actually a white paper that was written for a staff member. I just found this out a year ago. A staff member at Qualcomm, which you know, where they put the cell in cell phones, Erwin um, uh, Jacobs, who was, a, who was an MIT professor who figured out code division multiple access, a brilliant and great gentleman himself. At any rate, so that's how High Tech High got begun as a single uh, charter school, and we have now evolved into having um, elementary school, middle schools, and we've just built a brand new school that is the first gold lead certified charter school in the United States on the border, generates 110% of its energy on site with solar power. And we're 20 minutes from the most cross border on the planet, which is the uh, San Diego Tijuana border, and obviously we're on the Pacific Rim, so internationalism is a feature of what we are about. So our kids do a lot of, uh, a lot of production, and I'm going to just show you a few examples of it, because I think that I say to teachers, if you want to know how we judge your work, it's by how you, do, how you are as a teacher, it's by the quality of what your students produce. If your students are doing uh, uh, high quality work, the work that's worth doing, learning things that are worth learning and that have lasting value, then we think you are a good teacher. I showed this book at a meeting here yesterday, uh, which is uh, Perspectives. This is one of five books that 10th, uh, 11th graders did. This is three teachers in concert working with each other, uh, reflections on San Diego Bay, all of the math, all the science, all the photography, all the journalism, everything in this book was done by kids. They've done five of them, five different ones this, this team of teachers has done. The last one just came out, Jane Goodall wrote the introduction, E.O. Wilson, the famous entomologist, wrote the preface to the new one that just came out. And so the idea behind this is quite simple. It's Dewey and actually, it's behaving like a scientist, behaving like a mathematician, behaving like a journalist, behaving like a photographer. So that's basically us. I, I could talk more about it, but I just want, I, I think it's like, I always think about Jack Nicholson once said to a famously to an actor, a young actor who was nervous, he said, uh, don't worry, let the costume do the acting. I like to let the costume do the acting. I think the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. I think, again, if kids are doing sophisticated work, the teachers have to be uh, there's have to be something, something good going on. And then, as you saw at the test at the end of Analog Flash for Window, we still live within that world. Our kids still have to take all these tests. They still need to perform to get into selective universities, and they are, but it's engagement, in my opinion. Engagement uh, is a, is a precedes learning, and so we seek engagement. I, I went to a school in New York City, and I did... I did some um, social service work for my school, and it was tutoring kids at a settlement house down in the Bowery in Lower New York. I think that's where my becoming a teacher came from. So, so there's something uh, about E.O. Wilson's point about early, early exposure to behaving like, behaving like, being like. OK? 
okay? Sort of, we sort of see four phases to a project. There's a lot of typologies of projects. I mean, Dewey had one, the Danes have one. Ours is observation, reflection, documentation, exhibition. That's what this conference is. I mean, you know, some David and, and, and Valerie, they, you know, they, they observed, they looked around, they found, you know, they reflected on their observations, right, of, of checking out who's doing what. And then they documented their observations of their reflections, and then they uh, and then they uh, they they used various media. They they reflected, excuse me, on them. Then they used various media to document them, and then they brought us all here, which is the public. This is the exhibition is gathering us all. Most adults do projects. <laughs> That's what most of adult work is like. Is so different. why is it that the selective private schools in all of your cities have about 400 kids in them? and they charge lots of money to go there. And why is it that the public schools have thousands of kids? I mean, they're charging a lot of money, why don't they just have 2,000 kids? For a very simple reason, it doesn't work as well. So I don't, school size is not, a, is not the killer app, but it's the beginning of actually getting a handle on it, so you've got a collegial group of people who work with each other closely. When, you, when you're in a school, my, because I ran a 2,000 kid high school, I did it for years, I mean, who, so who's responsible? It was somewhere in between everybody and nobody. Right? Right? So we broke it down into five separate schools. Actually, six separate schools. We broke it down. We, okay. We broke it down into six separate schools and named them. I guess this is the, all, the, all the battles I lost, right, you learn from. They were named school A, B, C, D, right? So after a few years, the parents in school D, not to change it, because it sounded like their kids got Ds. So that, and then <laughs> they got changed. That got changed to something, and then C the next year got changed, and B A kept its for 20 years because it was A, right? <laughs> you know, and then there was a separate building. So you had five floors and a separate building, Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? And the top floor where Matt Damon and uh, you know went to school and uh, uh, some of those actors and stuff. That's like with the that's the highest socioeconomic status. Ben Affleck too. There's the highest socioeconomic status on the top floor, and I taught carpentry on the ground floor when I was a carpet teacher, okay? And we literally, this, the socioeconomic status of the families was like, just like an, like an apartment building, or the, who lives in a penthouse. And then all the, the kids from the Azores and from El Salvador and from Haiti, they were in the arts building, which was connected by a catwalk at the second floor, so that what they had in common was that they didn't speak English. They couldn't talk to each other, and they were in a separate building, and they called their building the island. So you talk about social class segregation. So it was imperfect, uh, and, and, but so then I changed two other high schools, which we did a whole lot better learning from that mistake in the Boston area. So the first thing I would do would be to break it down into smaller units. Why does parental anxiety about math peak at about the eighth or ninth grade, and then you don't hear from the parents anymore? Because that, right? Everyone knows that, right? Because that's the level of math that parents still can help their kids with, and after that, they just stop, right? Because they think that if you're good at math, you're smart. If you're not good at math, you're stupid. If you're good at math, you can do anything. You're not good at all these, all these ridiculous things. That's, that's a whole other topic. Go to the Essential High Tech High Math Curriculum, by the way, written by Jared Schiffman. Jared, it's on our website under resources. We've got all this stuff there. Um, Schiffman was, uh, John Maida was at the MIT Media Lab. He sent me a, an email saying, I hear Jared Schiffman is applying to work at your school. I just want you to know he's the consummate MIT whiz kid. In fact, he's the fastest programmer in any language on any platform we've ever seen at MIT. He also taught comedy improv to the kids and loved, anyway, so he did it. At the end of this, writing this curriculum, he sent an email blast out to scores and scores and scores and scores of all people, MIT grads of all ages and all occupations and said, how do you use math in your life and work today? Look at it, about 70% of the response are about statistics and probability. So what do we have? A calculus-driven system. That, I mean, so the real question about Nick is, do you really need to know how to subtract polynomials? I mean, he will never do this again in his life. That's a serious question. I, I mean, you know, I, you know, it really is. Where statistics and probability really have a role in all of our lives. Anyway, that's, another, that's a topic for another day. Well, just one more thing that's a really great thing to do is what we did do in Cambridge. Um, make it into urban planning high school. That, just think about urban planning high school. Make the curriculum, that what I would do, I'd make the curriculum into being uh, broadly 
On the one hand, let's study the vast unmet needs within your own community. That gives rise to a lot of great stuff. And on the other hand, let's look at the underutilized resources and underemployed people in your own community, and let's see the school place as a fulcrum where we are actually studying how to marshal underutilized resources to meet unmet needs. And that gets at this, I, uh, so many great exercises. We create a great curriculum called CityWorks on that that, that really helps do that.